Hey, I'm Nathan Tabor with Handling Life. Thanks for joining the podcast show today. I'm really excited about having Tammy Helm on the show today. She's the president and CEO of the Christian Leadership Alliance. And I didn't get to do my normal opening because when Tammy and I got on Zoom together, uh, we just started talking. So we're just going to jump right into it. I hope that you enjoy this show, and I hope that you will share it with someone who could benefit from it. It's so good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. How's um, how's your week going? It's full. My husband is um, gone for two days at a board meeting, and we took over responsibility as primary caregivers for his 85-year-old grandmother or mother. And um, so I've got, and she needs constant care. In fact, I told her, I'm going to be gone for an hour. Don't panic. <laughs> yeah, don't 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 panic or anything like that i'll i will be back exactly and then i am um, i do not know let's see the crazy things ringing like crazy there um let me get my ringer off um so he's gone and then you know we have a 12 year old daughter that we adopted from haiti so i've got all the middle school stuff like to school back from school all that not complaining but it's just like whoa this is so full yeah. Um, and then we're like in crunch time trying to get things ready for the conference. So. Yes. Our um, daughter started high school this year. Oh, my friend. I hear that. So it treacherous times. Oh, the, it is. I, I mean, I, I can't even. I mean, she came home one day and she, or the, the week before she went, she came home. And she said, well, Courtney at camp said that everybody in middle school sits in the back of the bus and they smoke and have sex. We couldn't even breathe. I was like, I thought I was just going to fall over. And she goes, ooh, I think I've shared this with the wrong audience. And then she came home after the first week of school. And she goes, you know, everybody cusses. Yeah. I'm thinking it's okay to cuss. Yeah. Um, can we just like sit here and go right back to God? <laughs> you know, no, it's not. It can't be vulgar. No, that's not what God wants. And so it's, I mean, every day I'm just like blown away with like well, last night. Um, Abigail, she was homeschooled the first, the seventh grade, um, Christian school, the eighth grade, and we put her into a STEM based high school magnet school this year, Atkins for the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. So, and she's very mature for her age in that, but she's like, you know, people are walking down the, the hall, you know, yelling the F word just yeah, for no reason, you know, nothing, not, nobody was heard or, you know, it wasn't uh, uh, some reaction that, oops, I shouldn't have said that. It just like, you know, and then she came home last night and she's like, Oh, some, and I don't, some TikTok or something. It's an, Oh, uh, it's terrible. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah. Now so I she, will tell you. She had some water bottle. And I don't even know, they can't remember the brand of it, but apparently there's a whole like section that people get made fun of for carrying this water bottle because they're considered preppy or, and my daughter's like a barn, you know, yard cat dog, you know, not a tomboy, but very close to it. And she's like, I can't carry this water bottle anymore. And I was like, <laughs> it's, yeah, not like when I went to high school. No, I mean, it. You know, you just, I do, we just like, I'm praying over her heart, her head, her mind. Yeah. And I'm trying hard to tell her that, you know, she needs to, she's, she's in this world, but not of this world and really helping her try to understand what does that look? Because, you know, she, a year ago, she made her confession of faith. She was baptized. And so now it's discipling her into i mean you know that's really been the work now i mean you know the the discipleship comes after the conversion and just what to do this and even like watching tv like yeah we, and i'm talking disney stuff we do not i mean she didn't have carte blanche to go into those things and i'm just sitting here and she's like not and so this idea of i have been charged your father and i have been charged to be the boss of your mind and heart right now and we are controlling the things that go into it because as you watch those things, you become desensitized to how they grieve the very heart of God. Yeah. And it's our job, you know, you need to know that they're there, but you need to know why you cannot engage in them 
because then they will become part of you. You are what you put in. So as Christian parents, yeah. how do, you know, some people, you know, not everybody can afford Christian schools. Well, and we, uh, we, and he, we let her go there and then we moved her to a public school. Public so, school. And, and even sometimes if you can't afford a Christian school, I graduated from a Christian school. Sometimes they don't have the, how can I politely say this? They don't have the best education. Right. They have the best foundation, but they don't have, especially if you're in the STEM, science, technology, robotics, most Christian schools don't have the money. So yeah, as well, a Christian parent, how do you make that decision? Because it was a huge, we struggled with it for well over a year. Too. We did too. And the timing of it, because we were driving, you know, 90 minutes a day to get her there and get her home. And then because she was behind we advanced her a year and then we had to you know we were basically spending four hours every evening reteaching her everything that she learned because they were going too fast for her little Haitian mind to understand it all but it um you know it's been it's been a real challenge now academically where she was just happened to be like top notch which made it even harder because you know, she came in, she didn't know American, she didn't know reading, and she was in the kindergarten, and they were starting chapter books. Yeah. You know, so she was woefully behind. So we had to tutor and basically homeschool supplement what she was learning in school to get her up in there. But, you know, sometimes you have to say, why well, we need to let her go, because you can't shelter the child either. And I often think that when we were youth, Dale and I were youth small group leaders, but it wasn't a small group because it was the entire teenage life group at our church that we helped plant. So we had them in our home every Sunday night. And candidly, it was the homeschool kids that struggled most with rebellion because they didn't know what they were saved from. The kids that were just picked up off the streets that had had a really hard life and came to faith were so much more zealous because they hadn't been sheltered. They know how hard life is. They know what it means to need Jesus and all of that. And, and we watched them just go through all sorts of painful rebellion because um, I want to make my own decisions, this whole Jesus thing. I think I've just inherited what my parents want. This isn't my, you know, the whole thing. So it's so hard. And I think as a Christian parent, to get your head around raising them up in the way that they should go, but not sheltering them so much that they don't understand and that you're not talking at the table about relevant issues that they are facing and guiding them along the way of these are the things that you need to know. And this is why you're precious. And this is why your heart matters. And this is why, you know, you know, and this is what kindness looks like. And this is compassion and, you know, if someone's mean to you, how do you respond to that? Because people are always going to be mean to you. And for her, you know, being a child of color on the Bible belt in the South, um, you know. With two white parents. With two white parents. She is, yeah. I have witnessed, I mean, she is often mistreated. I mean, think simple, like being in a restaurant and you know how they have those little wrapped candies. Yeah. She reaches in to get one and someone's saying, well, you know, I was going to have myself a peppermint, but now that little black girl's got her hands in there. I'm not touching anything. I mean, what is that? But they probably go to church every Sunday, so it's okay. But, I mean, it's just. I mean, sarcasm said in that. I mean, it, it is amazing. I go to a lot of uh, uh, churches and speak and black churches and I say, you know, <clears throat> from a racism side, Christians should be the ones who deal with this the first and the quickest and the best because we're all created in the image of God. Black, right. white, green, yellow. Um, the the little person of color is the same as me. So yes. I should love them the way God loves me. Yes. But somehow we separate that out. So what are a few things that Christian parents are struggling? You know, where do I send my kid? You know, I want to send them to Christian school, but Maybe it's a money, maybe it's an education. I mean, there's something, maybe it's too far. Maybe it's 90 minutes. What are some of the things that you went through with your husband to decide why was this the best choice for your daughter? 
Well, when we went through the adoption process, we had the opportunity to go with it with some other families from our church. And it just so happened that in that family, one of them was a teacher at a, a Christian academy that was close by. And so we got to know them through this three and a half year experience. And, you know, we witnessed their life and their children. And so we knew that that academy was used to accepting um, children from third world countries. So the staff had the knowledge and the wisdom of how to begin to integrate them and how they would actually have to love them different. And I would say that the faculty there was extremely loving. I mean, they were extraordinary in that way. And they also had an extraordinary love for Jesus. I mean, they felt the stewardship of those hearts were first and foremost. So there was everything about it was a positive experience that we said, well, let's begin there. And then we'll see how she evolved. And again, you know, she started kindergarten as an eighth grader with no language and couldn't read. And the teacher, the kindergarten teacher was one of those ones that she will look back and say, that woman was part of defining my life. No question, the impact of that one teacher's life on my daughter. And that teacher continued to mentor for the following four years that she was in the school and would tutor her and do all sorts of things, even though she was, you know, growing beyond just kindergarten. Um, and then, you know, we skipped a grade, we did everything. But then we came to that moment when she was in the fourth grade and she was kind of hitting her stride. And we said, you know, um, it's a decision point because it's becoming more difficult for her to engage and be involved in activities because of the distance. She wasn't making friends in the neighborhood. And she, we knew that the social relationship was really important. So that was a key factor. So if we moved her to an elementary school, so she would have a year of making new friendships that were more local to where we live, then when she would move to middle school, she would be going there with friends. And middle school is so hard anyway. So for us, it was like, where was she in her development? What were some of the sensitivities? What were the gaps that we knew we needed, she needed filling in her life and how could we provide that? And then, you know, seriously, Nathan, the idea that we're going to send our child to a Christian school and we're going to relegate their spiritual, her spiritual development to that school, you know, is a mistake. And people make it all the time. They think, well, if I just send my kids to Sunday, you know, to church on school and they do children's church or they're involved there in those programs, then, you know, I've done my spiritual thing, but they need to see it, living it out. In fact, I don't know if you saw that movie Overcomer. I haven't yet, but it, it's on our list of, of movies to see. Well, we took my daughter. In fact, it's been talked about so long that I actually thought it was the DVD coming out, not the new movie release. I mean, you know, we talk about movies well in advance in the Christian circle. So over the Labor Day weekend, we took my daughter and we got my mother-in-law in a wheelchair and we all went for a family experience and I know a lot of people I've read things that were pretty harsh and critical and then I've heard things that were lovely and true but the thing that I valued most about that movie was the parents demonstration of living out faith being imperfect but yet being accountable to each other and to God and how it influenced the children in observing that behavior and the decisions they made and how they live things out. So to me, it was a reinforcement that our faith, I mean, the greatest challenge is how we are living it out in our family. How does my daughter see me love my husband? How does he, how does she see me caring for this elder, elderly mother-in-law who is needy in every way? So what does compassion look like? And I think how we manage that in her life will be, and the conversations about what goes into her mind and her heart and her head here will have far more of an impact on her life than what she could have gotten in the Christian school or what she's getting, you know, going to, you know, the teen night or the, you know, the student night every Wednesday night at her church and being involved in all of that other stuff. I mean, she's, kids have to see the grit of the gospel lived out every day. Yeah. And parents. And that was one of the notes I had here was going to, you know, ask you as we went down through this of choosing for schools and that, you know, that importance of a child or children seeing how you 
and your husband how you show love, how you show compassion, how you show forgiveness. Absolutely. You know, um, and at times I can I find myself being guilty of this. You know, kind of do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, that's not something we want to stay in. If as a parent, if we're staying in that, do as I say, not as I do, at some point when those, that child or children underneath our control, then that's when rebellion comes in. Exactly. Because all they see is the hypocrisy, right? Oh, well, you say to forgive others, but you don't forgive. Exactly. You say to be kind to others and be respectful, but to that waitress or that waiter, man, you sure did tear them apart for bringing you their own drink. Well, and I'll tell you what, she she's a good accountability partner for us often. You know, there will be times that she will um, say thing like she'll say something and she'll challenge, like, why did you say that that way? Or what are you doing? Or even when my husband and I talk, we, we never like fight. We've been married like for getting close to 40 years and we've never, we've just, I don't know, just. Congrat been. Congratulations on that. That's a, you know, if people make it past the five or 10 or 15 year mark these days, it's kind of like, whoa, you've been married a long time. <laughs> we do talk intensely about things that are passionate. And for us, when she sees the passion ex escalate, she's saying, are you arguing? Are you mad at each other? And we're like, no, 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 baby. We're like wrestling with this. We're talking about this. This is, this is like important stuff. This is stuff that matters to God. So we're on it. So, um, that's cool. Yeah. My, my daughter's 14 now. And when she was probably six or seven, um, I was driving just here in town in Kernersville where I live and, um, state trooper pulled up behind me, blue lights on pulls over. And I used to have a bad habit of not wearing my seatbelt. I just would forget, especially if I was only going five or 10 minutes mm -hmm. and the officer trooper walks up to my window and, you know, roll my window down. And he said, Sir, did you have your seatbelt on? And before I can say anything, Abigail's sitting over my right shoulder. She immediately says, oh, he hardly ever wears his seatbelt. <laughs> and at the moment, I was a little bit like, hey, you need to keep your mouth quiet. You know, stay out of the adult conversation. But she was being truthful. Mm -hmm. She was being honest, no matter the consequences. In our adult lives, sometimes when we've done something wrong, especially with our children, it's best to go and admit that to them and apologize and, and not try to explain it away, but to, you know, turn it into a, a learning lesson. But a lot of times parents, including myself, if I do something wrong, I, the last person I want to admit it to is my child. Yes. How important is it for parents when they make a mistake to make it right with their kids? What oh. example are we setting? It has to happen. It has to happen. In fact, um, my daughter, she was preparing for her ballet recital. And, and again, she, she's a very strong real child. And so everything is a debate and, you know, what has to be a discussed, it has to be explained and she wants backstory. And, and sometimes, you know, that can be really wearing on a parent. And, and you want to say, because I'm your parent and I said so, which is really not the right response, but it takes a lot of patience to get beyond just saying that. And so we were in the car and she wanted to argue and she was saying she had this need to be right on something she wasn't right on and it wore me out. And so I said, Sonia, I think the best thing for us right now is that we just have some quiet time. We're not going to listen to the radio. Let's just you and I be quiet as we go because the conversation isn't helpful and it's not good. And, um, let's get there. And, and so, but she wasn't content with that. She wanted to do it. So I was just sitting there. I'm like, I'm not talking. So it was like stubborn against stubborn. Right. And then she sighed and she said something really inappropriate. And I just like break the car. And it was like, you know what? There's a lot of things you can say, but you can never say those words. And those are totally in a, you know, and then she was like kind of devastated. Well, all this is happening before she's going into her big ballet recital. And then she's upset. I'm set. We get there. And then before we go in, instead of her running out of the car, I just said, baby, wait a minute. I am really sorry that I reacted the way I did when we were having the conversation. 
And I'm sorry that it put you in a place where you said something that maybe you wouldn't have said if you weren't so frustrated. Let's get this right. Let's pray. Let's make it right. I'm sorry. You need to be sorry. And let's just start over because this is such a big day for you. And you have worked so hard to go on that stage and to just be this beautiful expression of what God has created you to be. So I know that we need to be in there right now, but let's just, let's just make this right and let's pray. Yep. And did. So, and thank you for sharing that because that, that is an example of how a relationship with a child can get torn apart. Not, just, not that one thing, but time and time again. Yeah. How I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna turn off my outlook because it okay. is like crazy. yes, dinging there. I didn't know if it was on my I shut mine down a minute ago, so um I'll go yeah. in and, and edit this. Yes. Are you taping? Yeah, I'm recording it. Well, audio and video. Oh, video. Our uh, audio video. Oh, I wasn't prepared to be video. Look at me. Oh, you look great. <laughs> I've got that halo thing behind me. No, it looks like it, on this end, it looks fine. We were just talking. I mean, this goes out. I mean, what I really like on this and what's been cool about this podcast is just the realness of it. Mm -hmm. As you know, when you get into a lot of in your role, being in, the, in a Christian, but also in leadership, there's a lot of just like weird, fake, unattainable things out there. Oh, if you're a Christian, your life's going to be grand and the Lord's going to do all these things for you and you're going to get all these blessings. Or if you're a leader, you'll have all these wonderful things. And mm -hmm. I mean, from I mean, my opinion, from a biblical standpoint, that's I not true. Find it. I don't know what Bible you're reading. I, the prosperity gospel of give God a dollar, I'll give you seven back. I, oh, I mean, it, and that is so true. In fact, more and more is the past eight years I've dedicated myself to doing a chronological Bible study every year. That's cool. I mean, yep. you know, just the discipline. Now I've done it in a variety of ways because you just experience God's words different. So I've used different, um, different plans, different translations. I've done audio. I've done all sorts of things, but I really got convicted that I was reading a lot more books about God's word than reading God's word. So I've really kind of been on this fast, a serious fast for three years and probably are only reading books that I'm asked to endorse um, because I don't want to consume. My margin is thin. Yeah. So the margin I have, I want to go right to the text. And, you know, I'm just seeing it over and over again um, that there's really nothing easy about the commitment and there was nothing easy about it when Jesus walked it. So no. for us to expect anything different, it wouldn't be. Now, the hope is we win, right? Is the victory has been sealed. And so there's something on the other side. So there's not anything that we would experience that would be so difficult that it would even compare to the glory beyond, right? Yeah. And, and that, in that, I think the lessons I've really been learning is not, oh, I have to go through this. It's I get to go through this and that God's going to do something. You know, the, the classic um, the classic scripture in James, you know, count up your joy, brothers, when you face trials of many times. Oh, now I've got to turn my adium off here. Oh, wait. I think that's the last thing I have that would be. Be open there. All right. Yeah. Usually when I sit on it, it I can just close it. Um, I'm sorry about that. Thank That's you. all right. Oh, there it is. Quit. My people think I've gone somewhere. It's that classic verse in James that talks about count up your joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, for the testing of your faith develops. Now, it's been interesting. The first time I memorized that verse, the word was perseverance. And so as I carried that scripture in my heart, the perseverance was when anything was difficult, I had to push through. Because doesn't that feel like perseverance to you? I mean, I got to grit down and I'm going to get through this. And then I went through this season where I was doing a lot of pushing and I wasn't doing a lot of waiting. And I memorized the scripture again because we were in the New King James. It was patience. And all of a sudden, 
that same verse, God was coming and speaking in a different way. And in patience, that means sit back and wait. And that in the waiting for God to move, he's perfecting us, keeping us mature in all things. And then recently um, in my discipleship group, we got to James again. And in the translation, we're in, the word was endurance. And it was just what I needed in that moment because I'm in a season with caring for my elderly mother-in-law, having a middle school, you know, working full-time in this ministry, you know, beyond full-time, marriage, you know, marriage, marriage, marriage and all that. Yeah. But it's this endurance. And so how sweet that in God's word in different seasons, the one word that we need to be complete, mature and lacking in nothing has shifted to meet me exactly where I am and what I need to hear. Yeah. Now, yeah. I would have, if I would have been reading other books and doing other things, I would have missed the nuance and the gift of God speaking into me in just how I needed to be and where yeah. I needed to be and what I needed to hear that, okay, this is an endurance. This is persevering. This is patience. Yeah. And all yeah. of them have a place, but they were so timely for an exact season. And see, in my season where I am in that, and I love that verse, is joy in all circumstances. So in all. Count not, it pure joy. Not pure joy, joy, not joy in the circumstance. Right. So we're not, it's not joyful if you're going through a trial or tribulation. There's no joy in that. The joy in all the circumstances that at some point. It might not be on this earth, right? But at yeah. some point, I will have joy because I'm going to heaven. That's right. I'm, I'm saved. I'm bound by the blood of Jesus oh. Christ. Yes. I've escaped hell. So that's my joy. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, and that, because of who we are, you know, the I am, is that, is that we have what we need to go through it. And instead of like the getting through it, it's, my prayers have shifted, yeah. you know, because I want God's will. But when I'm faced with adversity or difficulties, first of all, there's a correlation. Dependence on God goes way up. Yes. And you know what? When you have dependence on God, then he can show up to do what only he can do. Or it and should, it should go, it up. should go up. Right. It because I, I tell people, if you want to see miserable people who look like they've been sucking lemons, yeah. walk into most churches on a Sunday morning. Oh, there you go. Yeah, well. You know, that, because yeah. we should be depending on God. Yes. In our circumstance to give us the patience or the comfort or the compassion or, you know, whatever we need. But often we turn in inter internally. And like James says, we start applying our own wisdom to our life versus God's wisdom. Yes. And then we get this conflict and misery and anxiety and, and whatever else. So it's really critical when those storms do come that we turn to God and into God and into his word than to pull away from him. Right. But that dependence on him, I think when he keeps us in there, like, you know, there's many a times in the conversation that, you know, first of all, I'll just say, God, your will. Now let's just, now just let me rant and, you know, and then you adjust my mind and my heart. I'm going to put this on the altar and you alter it so that it's pleasing to you. Let this be my living sacrifice in this day. But I think when the rock falls, then um, the pain is so great. I mean, there's been times where, you know, here I'm in my office, I have a chair over there. Like I've just been on my knees weeping and fasting and just saying, I don't know, I can't see. I know that you're with me and I just need to know the next step. I, I don't even need to see the other side. Just show me the next step and let me be faithful in that, in that obedience. But I, I need you so much. Yeah. I need you. Because when things are going well, you know, we're, we're feeling good. And then we start feeling good about ourselves. So that's like such a, a dangerous place to be. But the shift in my prayer. Hey, Tammy, real quick before we go any. So break that down just a minute for me there. Okay. So people understand. Because sometimes, not with me, but at other times. But when you hear someone say, oh, well, you know, I'm down on my knees and I'm I'm praying and I'm I'm emotional, I'm crying, or you know, I just don't know what to do, that can be perceived as being weak. 
No, no. I think as I, being out of control. I know you don't mean that, but can you go into that a little bit of why would you, someone who's successful, the track record you have, the organization you lead, why would you be down on your knees crying out to the Lord for help? Well, I think we go through and, you know, as Christians, we have our time before God, we're in the word. We try to step back <clears throat> from situations and lens of God on them and say, you know, Lord, help me see this how you do. But then there's times when we encounter something that we never expected. You know, there's a disruption that is beyond anything that we could have any sense of control over. And immediately, like anything, we're either going to fight or we're going to flee. You're not good responses. But really, that's the time we have to say, all right, I just have to be before God. I need clarity on this. Um, I can't see what's next. And I know that right now, there is nothing in me that can change this bigger disruption. So I need to see God's way through it. And, um, and the, the being on your knees, I mean, you know, scripture talks about, you know, being in the point where, you know, the, 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 the spirit prays beyond us, right? When it's yeah. the utter and the moaning, but the spirit makes known the things that we're seeing. I mean, God sees it all, but to be in that place before God, I think of all the times in scripture when men of God saw the spirit of God and it was like flat on their face in the presence of God, you know, um, I am undone by what I see, you know, that moment when you just encounter and you need God so des desperately. Well, it's just going and saying, here it is, just show me. And th those are the times when I think we can't see. Now, we can see rough patches in our lives where like, oh, this is going to be a tough season. I just, Lord, I just need you with me. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to endure. I'm going to like be, whatever it is. And sometimes we can see, but that's where I'm going. And we realize there's this huge gap, Nathan, between where we are and where God is requiring us, the, where the invitation will take us. But we see what it is he wants to accomplish. But it's a, we need him in the gap. And then there's other times where there's a gap that is unknown and we have no idea what's on the other side of that. I think of the three and a half year journey to adopt our daughter. Everything along the way was an obstacle and doors kept closing. And we would be in that place like, we don't know what to do. We don't see it. We don't understand it. Even in the final week we brought her home, there was a moment that we thought we would never see her again, that there was a movement in the country to even dispose of her so that just any record of us even pursuing her, and this is after we, she was like technically our, doctor, or our daughter, and that, that, you know, we were in the midst of, I think, just this spiritual evil going on that's so present in that country, right? And just saying, we have no idea what we're going to do. And then it was interesting because there was a church that was interceding for us. And a woman stood up and she said, that child will come home because of compassion and mercy. She will come home. And we know that mercy comes before grace, right? Compassion and mercy. And she said that, and then we went through this whole thing. And then the woman who was over the U.S. Embassy at the time, because they were trying to cut down on corruption in Haiti, you know, I mean, talk about a lofty goal, right? And she called, and they had prolonged the pain of what it was and of this adoption. And then she said, well, we found the things that we need to do, because she was using us as kind of the example to identify places that needed to be fixed in the adoption process, right? And the US Embassy had just been given the investigative power to do that. And she came back and she said, well, here's what I can tell you because we, she had been working with us. She said, um, we've investigated everything about this child. She is truly an orphan in every way. She has no family. And we have diligently searched for that. I have interviewed that child. I have spent time with you. The process of adoption here, you just need to know it is totally corrupt. Now, I'm not saying you're corrupt or whatever, but just the way that it's done these days are not the standard that we would want this done. And you just need to know that. But you also need to know that I know she loves you. And I've seen how you love 
her. So I'm signing this visa today out of compassion and mercy because she deserves what I know you will provide her. That's an, I mean, gives me chill bumps. I mean, like, but I mean, but yeah. you don't understand. I mean, my husband was in the country and, you know, he had heart problems and he had to be escorted out. I was in, I mean, there was all this intense drama that I felt that every day the forces of darkness was doing everything it could to shut this thing down. And it was beyond me, Nathan. I mean, beyond me. I mean, watching my husband almost die. I mean, all of these things and just saying, God, you made this invitation possible. I mean, we were in our mid fifties. Who adopts a child in our mid fifties? Who, I mean, you talk about a crisis of faith. Stepping in and doing that. I mean, I have a, a 12 year old and a 34 year old. Um, but we said yes. And even that whole story was so beautiful and such a, a, a walking out and a waiting. But that, again, when I was talking about the changing in our prayer, it's not, it's not God fix this. It's God, show me the next step and show me what it is you need me to see and know in this. Yeah. And I think that right there, at least for me, and I think most Christians I know, it's yeah. the Peter walking on water illustration of keeping our eyes on Christ. Yes. But not knowing if the next step, you know, what's going to happen next. And God doesn't always reveal to us. Most of the time, at least in my things, it's not, hey, Nathan, you're going to do one, two, three, four, and we're going to get up here to 26. And here's every detail. It's normally like, hey, here's number one and here's number 26. Now have faith in me. And like the story you just shared, I'm sure there were moments where you were like, yeah, God, what's going on? Or where are you? Or you know, why are we going through this? Why is my, why did my husband almost die? I'm, I'm doing your will. Right. Like I'm helping this child out. And you've brought all this other, allowed all this other turmoil to come into my life. Like what's up? Well, there was a point in that where I was in Haiti and she was sleeping and we were, you know, they, that was part of the bonding. So she was sleeping in bed with me and there was like a moonbeam coming through the window across her face. And you know how, when someone sleeps on your arm, then you can't feel your arm and you don't know if them or you and that had happened but I didn't want to move because she was so precious and I really felt the spirit of God just say don't miss the wonder in the waiting mm. yeah you know we want to get through things and God's like I'm giving you this moment to love her and to know her and to love her and you can't tell where she ends and where you begin tonight I'm giving you a love for her as if she was from you, you know, and I, and so in that it's like, okay, God, all right, got it. Going to be hard. You're with me. You promise you will be there. You will help me. You will not forsake me, but help me see these things, not through the eyes of Tammy Heim. That's so imperfect and so flawed, but help me to see them. Help me to put on your glasses so that I have your lenses to see things from the heavenlies. In fact, in first Peter, there's, you know, in the, in the first chapter, you know, it's talking about hard stuff, but there's a reference in there about the angels wanting to get in on it. And I love the translation in the message just because it's beautiful, but in it, Eugene Peterson talks about here we are on this earth and we're fighting this stuff out. We're at war and that there's angels like on staircases up to the heavenlies and they're seeing it and they can see darkness and God at work and they're cheering us on and the angels actually ache to be in our place because they see it from a different place and I think about that I'm like God no matter how hard this is let me see it from the heavenlies yeah see it as you see it so that I have your perspective and that I can somehow reflect you in the midst of it that's an excellent point so seeing that perspective and going through all you went through you were able to show the love of christ to others you were able to share the gospel with them you know kind of going back to that james you yeah. could have thrown your fist down on the table and said listen here i've paid my money yeah. i've signed my documents give me my daughter yeah i mean you i'm gonna get a lawyer i'm gonna do this i'm gonna you know give me your suit you could have just and had every reason and every right 
from an earthly standpoint to do that, right? Well, and there was resistance because there were a lot of temptations, again, in this situation, which is not uncommon for international, but people want money to make things happen. Sure. Yeah, bribes. But if you had done that, you would have missed out on the joy of that that waiting, right? Well, and that, that little pressure, but you also, what kind of example, what kind of testimony would you have left behind you? Yeah. If God has ordained this and he has set us on this course and he's moved obstacle after my obstacle, why would we think that we would intervene on our own to do something that we knew that was not, did not have the level of character and integrity of the God we serve? Yeah. Even if, regardless of what it might, might mean. An interesting story after that, after she said that, we got on the phone because it was right around Christmas. And so there was a, a, a travel agency that just does travel for adoptions because especially when you're coming from a third world country, you know, it gets different kind of clearance and acknowledgement. So they were on it and they said, okay, we're going to book the flight. They said, we need to come here. We need, we have one day to get there and it's Christmas. So they're online and they're waiting for us to send our passports. Then they call and they say, just give us your numbers because the prices are going up. They're escalating. They're exploding right now. So we got to lock in. A, I mean, or it's going to cost you like $12,000 just to go get her on flights. So we're doing this. And it was interesting going to Haiti. There were only two seats on any flights going there. Coming back. There were only three seats open. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, I mean, who could do that? But again, in that it's like God saying, just don't forget this is mine. Yeah. This is mine. Now it still really was expensive to get it, but I just marvel at that. I think yeah. only two seats on every airline on the day that we need to go. But if you we hadn't have been it, where it dollars for him, if we could, you know what I mean? It yeah. was, but if you hadn't have been where God wanted you to be and yeah. been in the right mindset, right. would you have ever made the correlation of the two seats and the three seats? Oh no, no. If we didn't, if we didn't, if we weren't working, walking by faith, and if we weren't doing even the whole adoption out of obedience, um, no, we would have we would have missed all of that. But you know, it's it's just those defining times. And then what happened is after that, I mean, you you build your faith and confidence. I mean, I love in Romans when it talked about Abraham and how he never wavered in unbelief, but he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what he had promised he would provide and it was a credit to him as righteousness and so this fully convinced and thinking about what abraham went through in his waiting and that he just kept giving glory to god and his faith grew well in each of circumstance in our life our faith grows so that we can get to a place of being fully convinced either we believe he is who he says he is or we're not or we're fully convinced that he is sovereign and what happens is ordained by him I mean, you either are in or not, you know, you, you can't, you know, there's no, we either believe or we don't. Oh. oh yeah, sorry, it has the audio click there. You know, you go back to James. We can't serve two masters. That's right. You can't be, you can't write. I grew up in the South and we called it riding the fence. And if you've ever sat on top of a wooden fence and slid along the top of it. Yeah. Splinters. Splinters. <laughs> yes. And that's life, right? If we're, and, and that's where I was for a long time in my life. And, and occasionally, you know, I still, I still find myself in that, but you know, if you're there and you're staying there and you've got God over here on the left and the white picket fence in the middle and your life over here on the, the other side and you're riding the fence, Life is eventually, seasons will come, you'll have good times, things will go well. Jonah, when he left out of the port, probably beautiful sailing. Mm -hmm. Things will be okay for a time period. Mm -hmm. But when you catch that storm or you catch that big splinter or something comes along, it really can, can rock your world and everyone else around you. Yes, yes. No question. And again, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, we have perfect faith and we've done that, but I, I think... For me, it's Lord fully convinced 
you know, like when I, when something is really difficult, I mean, I, you know, it's just having the, the intention on it to say, Lord, I just, I'm coming before you fully convinced that you were God. Yeah. I'm giving you thanks. And you um, talked about that earlier. The only way you can get to that point is by spending time in God's word. Yes. Not going to church. I mean, to, going to church helps and going to Bible studies helps and listening to Christian music helps and listening to podcast helps, but it really comes down to your personal time in God's word, yes. studying his word, not just reading it, but breaking down those words. And how does this apply to Tammy's life? How does this apply to Nathan's life? How does it apply to your life? And then actually, you know, taking that knowledge and applying it to your life. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, once I got into that habit and discipline of, you know, reading the Bible through the year and, you know, devoting myself to that. It, what I found is <clears throat> every day God meets me exactly where I am with wherever I am in the, in the word and the study. Um, every, every time. And so there's been times when people say, okay, well, you know, get along, be present to God's word. I'm just like, well, I'm just going to go and feast on what is served up for this day because it's always more than enough. And I'm almost, I'm, I'm astounded by how, how he does that. It's not like, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read this story or I remember this. I mean, it's just every day yeah. to in his word. I mean, that's the living part of it, that it's alive and it's relevant right now. And, um, you know, and I get spanked sometimes I get convicted. Um, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not, anywhere where I need to be. I, I, I love the phrase. In fact, I, I used to use it as kind of a byline. I said, you know, I'm under construction, seeking the utter relief of holiness. Yeah. My yeah. phrase is I use, I say I'm a recovering sinner. Yeah. You know, I'm in a program and the program's called God's word. That's right. That's right. And I'm, say, I'm saved. I'm Christ-like, but I'm not perfect. I still have my sin nature, and if I feed my sin nature, it becomes the strongest. If I feed my spirit, the Holy Spirit, and God and Jesus in my life, it becomes the strongest. Yes. But it doesn't take very long to, to flip. Right. It can happen in an instant if I get out of that mindset of what has God called me to be. Yes. He's called me to be an example. And that's that's the for me that's one of the struggles is the is keeping where in in god's word where i need to be so i can be the example that i need to be yes exactly so what do you think what would you recommend to people if they're in that situation they're saved they know jesus christ as their personal savior but they're not, they don't have that daily Bible study. They've not convinced that maybe God can take care of every, you know, in their, their, in their words, they say, yes, I, I have faith and God can take care of all my needs, but they're not there mentally. Yeah. Well, what would, you, what would you recommend to someone who's listening to this show? Where can they start? Where can they go? What would be a, a good starting point for them? I have a perfect one. All right. Um, now here is here is a, a study I'm doing right now. It's called Foundations. It's the New Testament. Now this is a little bit different. And I you know I said chronological. This is actually the first year I am just doing the New Testament. It turns out that there's 266 chapters in the New Testament. When you take weekends out of a year, there's 266 days. So this year um, I've been. Um, going through, it's called Foundations New Testament, the 260-day Bible reading plan for busy believers, right? Because that's what people always say, they're just too busy to do this. And it's by Robbie and Candy Gallaty and Gus Hernandez and Tim LaFleur. And what it is, is it is every day I'm reading a chapter in the New Testament. And then it's like a hear journal approach, which is very simple. This is simple. So, and I'm like, you can just see how marked up my pages are. So. There's a little summary about that chapter, a little perspective on it. And then I do hear journaling. So the first thing is in that reading, in that chapter, what really stood out to me? What do I highlight? So what is it that I just read this and there's all this, but what just, I'm like, wow, God's really speaking to me. 
And then you have an opportunity to just kind of explain it. Like, really, what is God saying there? Which causes you sometimes, I mean, I love this, um, Warren Worsby's Walk in the Word. A lot of times if a scripture stands out me, I'll go, look at this. It's so, it's so worn, it's in two pieces. But um, I'll go in there and I'll look up that scripture and just, you know, you know, another interpretation, you know, commentary. I'm like, what is it? I try to explain it. And then I go to application. So how does this apply in my life? You know, and then I write a response. And my response may be one, oh, Lord, you got to seal this to my heart. I need to walk in this. I mean, it's really that confession of that, how I need to apply that if I'm not applying it. Yeah. Or thank you, Lord, for the revelation of this. Thank you that you taught me this early and your faithfulness to me as I've lived it out. I mean, whatever it may be. But this is a, this is such a basic beginning. I mean, one chapter in the New Testament, and it does go in a chronological order. And um, it's, it's amazing. And then what I'll do is I will, um, you know, I have my Bible, but then I will go on Bible Gateway. Yep. And you can get the audio version. And so a lot of times I will read the chapter on there and I'll hit the audio and I'll listen to it as I read it. It's just, it's, it's just, you know, what kind of learner you are, but it's more, it's a more engaging experience, yeah. obviously, when you're doing that. And then if I hear something, then I can like scroll and I can highlight and I know that, you know, that's really where God sits. So I think it's just, I mean, and this is, this is simple. I mean, I've done much more complex studies, but just begin and where, you know, and beginning in the, in the New Testament, I think for new believers or ones that need to get into it. I make a big difference. Now, I do love the full Bible, like the meta story of it. And actually, they create one that's a, a full year that I've done. Um, because the it's the whole story. Like you, you can't appreciate the new until you understand what God was doing in the old. And the connectivity and the presence of Jesus in the Old Testament is so profound once you begin to kick. So that, and I would call that a little bit more meat yeah getting this, into a little more of the in-depth yeah i think this is a great uh, discipline and i'm going through this and and i'm going through it with my discipleship group yeah which adds greater accountability so, one of the things i love to do is i've got a um, hebrew and greek study bible yeah. Yeah. and i love to see what does that word actually mean because words today the word truth in our society today means true until proven untrue yes word truth in god's word is absolute unchanging yes so like what you know what you're talking about there in in i, I love those materials of getting something that's a daily for me and for everyone it might come to it in a different way but it really comes down to it's a choice when you well, wake, when you wake up in the morning you decide to or whenever you make the choice to set that time aside to spend in god's word yeah. Or you can say, oh, I don't have the time, or I, I am too busy, I think is one that when you had said. No, it's a choice. It's a choice to serve God. It's a choice to study God's word, right? Well, and you can, again, there's the establishment. In fact, I just wrote a post for Facebook today about going to Haiti and the consistency of establishing patterns and how we've done that in the life of the orphans there that we serve, of discipleship. So something like this foundations right in this little here journal this message of you know hearing you know highlighting a verse explaining it then applying it and then responding how am i hearing from god in his word the fact that the chapters are only monday through friday if you get crazy you can catch this up so a lot of it is you know don't go into something like say well if i'm not perfect then i have to abandon it but you're just like no just begin and if you have a day and something happens and you don't miss, then take that time on the weekend, catch up. It gives believers the room to breathe as they're developing the patterns versus saying, oh, I'm going to get on the bike and I'm going to go three miles. Oh, I can't go three miles. I'm just not going to ride the bike anymore. We're quit. We're quitters, right? I mean, in the sense like, exactly. you know, why, why even start if I can't get there? Right. But that, so, that's that in the, in studying scripts, that's just the devil playing in your mind. 
Yes. It's just him convincing you that you're not worthy and you're not perfect. You know what? I'm not worthy and I'm not perfect. That's why I need to be in God's word. Yes, exactly. And he repeats himself often. I often say that God in his word repeats himself and it's directly proportional by how many times he tells us certain things compared to our need for it. Yeah. So, you know, you've heard people talk about what well, says don't fear 365 days in the Bible because we need to hear it that much. Yeah. So I feel like, because sometimes people say, well, scripture doesn't say a whole lot about this, so maybe it's not important. It's like, no, it's pretty clear and you need to know it and that's the truth. There's other things that he has to remind us constantly. He has to remind us that we've been saved by grace. He has to remind us of the promise of eternity. He has to remind us that when things are difficult, that he is there. I mean, there are things, and I do, I believe there's a direct correlation between the amount of time God focuses on a theme and our need to know it because the devil tries to steal the knowledge of it from us. So we have to hear it often. Yep. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And it doesn't mean that the other things that are discussed in scripture are not as important. Well, they don't talk about it a lot or whatever. I don't think so at all. I think those things just become clear. But the other things, I need to know it every day because those are the challenges I'm going to meet every day. Because the enemy only has two arrows in his quiver, I believe. Pride and fear. Yep. And all the nuances of that, he will use to destroy us and take us out. And as believers, if we can identify and recognize, you know, like if I'm thinking more of myself, I'm allowing the opportunity for pride to set in. If I'm thinking less of myself in a situation, I'm allowing fear to overcome. And I say, I can't, or I'm not good enough, whatever. I'm going to let that stronghold. Or when I say, oh, well, I just know so much more about that person. I just got, I mean, or, oh, I just did a really good job. When we let those thoughts become our thoughts, then it swells up. And pride's one of those words that oh, yeah. it's okay to be, to have pride, to have pride in the way you look, to have pride in the way you dress, you know, to, to be. Well, that's stewardship. In my mind, that is right. stewardship of what God has given you. But um, in our society today, those words have become very interchanged. You yeah. know, oh, you don't have pride, but you need pride. Well, no, you need stewardship. You don't need pride. Yes, you need the stewardship. It's like, God has given me this home I need to care for. I mean, yep. these are the things that we've been blessed with. I mean, you know, we laugh all the time. We have our, our small group from church. You know, we rotate houses and we are in the living room. And I'm like, now y'all know that this furniture is 39 years old. And they're like, are you kidding me? I'm like, no. I mean, you know, my husband and I've always said, we're just going to really care for the things that we have. So when you go through the home, I mean, it's things that have been there, but, but, you know, we're careful with, you know, we steward our money to buy things that we know, like we can only buy one thing a year, but we make sure that it's good and it's going to endure and it's going to be there and that we love it and that it brings us joy and that we're grateful for it. And then we care for it forever. I mean, you know, people say, you know, we animals live the longest with us. Because we, I mean, we had a fish, a goldfish for like 12 years. Who has a goldfish for 12 years? I mean, somebody who takes good care of their goldfish. But, but it's, it's the attitude of God owns everything and whatever we have the choice and whatever he's given us, we need to make the most of it. So let's care. Let's care for ourselves. Let's care for the things around because that is an example. I mean, Christian Leadership Alliance, it's all about the stewardship of the business of ministry. We want people to be authentic and true and have integrity in the way that they operate their ministry so that it becomes a witness in and of itself. And through that faithfulness, they're positioning themselves for God to give them the delight of doing more ministry on his behalf, having a greater role in his purpose. So this idea of stewardship and being stewards and not owners of the things that God have given us. But Again, I think pride and fear are, and the nuances of those, that's where the enemy works. It's no new tricks. It's no anything. But as Christians, we have to be aware of it and recognize it. And it's difficult to do if we're not in his word. Yep. And Timothy comes out and directly addresses the fear. Oh, yeah. Well, says, every, fear every, is not of God. 
No. So if, if fear is not from God, where is it coming from? Well, and think of how many times God himself said, do not fear. Yeah. I mean, it's all through scripture. It's like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I mean, even when the angel came to Mary, don't be afraid. Yeah. I mean, she's just say, like, don't. Right. This. And I think often as Christians, one of the greatest fears we have is the real power of God unleashed. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> a know? good point. So. In the real fear of, you know, in, in that vein of, well, if I go out and, and do this and it doesn't work out, is God real? And if we're putting that measure to God, we really got to step back and say, well, is what we're asking, is that his will? Yeah. You yeah. know, just because we ask God, there's a lot of confusion. We started out with this, you're talking about the prosperity gospel and that, but then there's a lot about, you know, it just because you ask God for something doesn't mean he's going to give it to you. Right. His timing is, is interesting. I mean, here's just a, another real quick story. Um, again, I was at church on a Wednesday night and we were, you know, again, doing the Bible study and there were women around and we were committed on this journey. And some woman shows up in church, Nathan, that we, none of us knew her, but we invited her to sit at our table. And I didn't talk a lot about the adoption because, you know, we were taking enough slack for being at the age we were in that. And then someone said, Tammy, I want to know how to pray for you. Just give us a little update. And, you know, in three and a half years, there's big seasons of not a lot of update. Right. And this woman sat down and she said, oh you're one of those. You're going to go adopt a kid from a third world country. She's going to come home. She's going to be a total mess and she's going to destroy your life as you knew it. Yeah. You tell me how you're just trusting God for this big thing. Well, that was shocking. I mean, who says that, right? Well, no one knew her. And then I could tell that everyone at the table wanted to like come to me. And I said, well, you know what? I don't know about that. All I know is that God's called me to this. But I went home that night, Nathan, and I said, okay, God, I'm trying to process what I heard now. And I was back on my knees again. And I said, here's what I know. I know that you've called me to this. And maybe this is your way of saying this could go really bad. And you're trying to prepare my heart for something. It doesn't matter. Regardless of the outcome, I am all in. I'm all in. If this comes and there's, and this is just going to bring heartbreak, hardship for the rest of our lives. If I'm going to be obedient, I'm all in. And I'm trusting you to give me what it takes to do that. And then I filed that away. And then after we brought our daughter home, I was teaching a leadership class, you know, for an organization. And I think I only mentioned my daughter's name once. Now it was an orphan care organization. And after it was over, there was a woman from Argentina who spoke Spanish. And she wanted, she said to the leader of that organization, I have a word for her, but I don't want to try to say it in English. Will you translate? So she came to me and she said, and she explained it. I mean, it was a little awkward. Like, I don't know this woman. She's from Argentina. She has a word for God for you. And she wants me to translate it. Are you comfortable with that? And like, who's going to deny that, right, Nathan? Exactly. And she said to me, you call your daughter Sonia, but the father calls her Abigail because she is the joy of the father. And he wants you to know that he is imparting his joy in your life through her. You think you've saved her from being an orphan, but you have saved her from a darkness that you will never understand or comprehend. You must teach her the things that you've taught us here today. And she will learn to love and follow Jesus in your teachings and the way that you worship him. And God will use her to return to her country and share the gospel with the multitudes. That's awesome. Well, that was probably the ugliest cry that I had ever had in my whole life. <laughs> now, at the time that woman came and wanted to just speak this terrible thing, I had a choice. I could be in fear of, oh, no, this is really going to go bad. What if this happens? I could have gone there. But when you give it back to God and you just say, whatever. You're in control. You've got this and you're calling me to it. So I just expect you to be with me, to guide me through it. And what it will be, well, it will be. And God saw that. And I believe that he had favor. And after we brought her home, after that really difficult time, he took a woman from Argentina. I mentioned her name one time. And she had it all written down in Spanish. 
and went through all of this extraordinary way to say, my promise. I felt like Abraham when God kept taking him out and saying, see all the stars in the sky? Yep. See all of them? That's going to be the family. That's going to be your nation. That's what I have for you. I felt like, God, you love me so much. When I did not even expect it, he would say, I have a plan and I have a promise. That's cool. My daughter's name is Abigail. Oh, is it? Well, then you know about so, the joy. Yeah, that that was, so to hear that, that's really cool yeah. because um, we thought we were having an it. We, did, <laughs> we, prayed, we prayed for healthy and we didn't know if a boy or girl we thought it was going to be a boy just because of yep. all the boys in my nice side and that. And then it ended up being a little girl. And um, that's cool that that lady, uh, you know, spoke over your daughter because, hey, God has a plan. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for her. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for everyone. The question is, right, right in that plan, like Jonah, the immediate comes up and says, well, what if this goes wrong? Or what if this happens? Exactly. And at that point is where we got to lean into God, right? Yes. That's where we've got to double down, triple down, get into that relationship because God promises us. He doesn't promise that things are going to go easy. He doesn't promise that the process is going to be easy, but he promises that he'll take care of us. Yes, always. Always. And that's where I get tripped up. I think that's where a lot of Christians get tripped up in their lives is they know what they should be doing. They know what they should be doing on behalf of God and the kingdom, but there's a fear, there's a pride or a fear or both that comes in and tells them why they shouldn't do that. So they do a Jonah. They walk the other way. They're not doing anything bad from an earthly standpoint, right? They're not out drinking or dealing drugs or doing anything wrong from an earthly standpoint. They're just not doing what God has asked them to do. That's right. That's right. And then they wonder, where is God? Right. I mean, you know, I mean that, you know, that old song, trust and obey. There's no other, other way. One, one, <laughs> yeah. of my favorite, one of my favorite songs. No, I know. And, um, you know, really they, they go, they go in hand and not obedience because it's a bad thing. You know, I teach children's church at our church and, you know, it's little ones, it's kindergarten and first grade. And, you know, we just always talk about, you know, God's best plan and that yeah. obedience is what we get to do, not what we have to do. It's yeah. not intended to limit us. It's intended to direct us. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. better than God's best. Yeah. But even that word obey today in our society oh, yeah. has become like, Oh, you don't, you do what you want to do. Don't ever let anybody tell you what to do. Well, we, we kind of live in a time where the boundaries of obedience, for instance, I was, ha I was having a conversation with my husband. It's like, we got a notice from the school that my daughter had three assignments that had not been turned in. So she came home and I was like, Hey baby, we need to talk about this. So I got notice. You have these three assignments and they were due and they're not coming in. I'm like, you're like, you're carrying zeros right now in three classes. And I'm like, so you want to talk to me about that or where they're missing? And she's like, mom, I got three days to turn those in. There's the deadline. And then I get three days. Then if I don't get it in in the three days, then I really do get a zero. And she pulls it out. And she's like, I just wasn't finished with it. And I said, baby, let's try something. Let's try to get it done on the day it's due. So it's done. So that you don't ever have the burden of the carryover. Yep. But even that, I thought, when I went to school, when I, when it was due, it was due. Yeah. Now we say, here's the due date, and then you get three days. So, I mean, the, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the boundaries are extended in ways that it's really hard to see. Yeah. Or this is right, unless yeah. you come from this perspective, and then this is – there's no – definite there's like they talked earlier truth truth is absolute you know yes. definite this is it yes well, the due date's not today if you get three days the due date's three, three. days after the date you set <laughs> right but but just that conditioning of oh, yeah. how you're saying well, that, that yeah. mental thought and process I of it. grace but i think you know as you're just trying to guide and you're helping people to say i mean even for the value of our word and say, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this by this day. That's our word. That's the yeah. one thing that we can only give. Yeah. So, and that's where God's word comes from. When He says forgive or love or care for, there's yeah. no but in there. Right. 
Right. There's no, oh, oh, forgive. But if this person's done you really wrong, you know, if they fired you from your job or they stole from you or they cheated you, you don't have to forgive them. You just have to forgive her. There's God says to forgive, right? Yeah. Like with a radical multiplier on it. Yeah. <laughs> 70 times seven. Every time it comes up, you got to forgive them. That's right. But in our society, and, and what the sin nature really comes from is like, well, I don't want to do that. Well, that's not God. And then God comes in and addresses that. It does, you know, whether you want to do it because you fear God or you love God, the result's the same. And that fears the, the, the respect, not as in trembling. And that has really taken over our society and our education and our thought processes and employment employers of there's this ability to say, well, that doesn't apply here. Yeah, exactly. So Tammy, thank you so much um, for joining me today. It's been such a encouragement to hear what God has done in your life, to hear you share about, you know, the trials and tribulations of going through an adoption and how God worked in that to bring that together and how you leaned into him on that, to hear about your Bible studies and that. How can other people find out about uh, you and the uh, organization you work with? Well, you can find out about Christian Leadership Alliance at www.christianleadershipalliance.org. Um, and again, you know, we focus on the, the business of ministry so that we steward that with excellence. And again, we can position ourselves to allow God to have us be um, even a bigger part of his redemptive plan for this world. Um, we primarily support and help nonprofits, which also include churches and educational institutions. Um, we are unapologetically Christian, and everything that we teach and all the disciplines are grounded in God's word. So um, it's an alliance for the alliance, the things that we do. I convene the places, or I create the places and spaces where wisdom can be exchanged. It's iron sharpening iron to the ultimate degree. Um, the organization's existed for over 40 years, and now we're envisioning what's it going to look like for the next 40 years so that we can make sure that we can equip future generations. And if so someone's listening who runs a ministry, and they say, oh, well, maybe what type of ministry comes in and joins your organization? Well, the thing that's beautiful about Christian Leadership mm -hmm. Alliance is that it really represents all aspects of the parachurch. So we may have rescue missions, pregnancy centers, adoption agency, Bible translators, um, humanitarian groups. I mean, founding members are organizations like the Salvation Army and Campus Crusade for Christ and the Navigators and World Vision and Compassion International and Samaritan's Purse. So there's really large ones. And then there's ones that, you know, people there's ones like this podcast, Handling Life. Is, a, life. is a member of your organization. Yes. So um, it's all different sides. But again, I go back and I say, you know, the gospel came to us on its way to someone else. My pastor always says that. But I think our experiences as redeemed children of God is that our experiences are never just for us. I mean, this conversation today, I would pray, would be an encouragement to someone else. And so at Christian Leadership Alliance, we want to learn from each other. So it's an ecosystem of leaders investing in each other to strengthen the all of kingdom work. You know, so there's really an abundance mentality. And 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, many different ministries, many different activities, many different um, gifts. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to everyone for the profit of all. So that really best sums up the spirit and the things that we do at Christian Leadership Alliance. And people can learn more by visiting our website. That's awesome. And you guys have Facebook as well? Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're, we have a LinkedIn group for those that um, you know prefer that professional platform. And we're even on Instagram. Um, and if you like to collect things, we even have Pinterest pages. So um, we're collecting content. And um, last year, we had the privilege through leaders within the Alliance to influence the thinking behavior and the development of over 1.2 million leaders. That's awesome. That's all. Yeah. You guys do um, an amazing work of the content you have there because 
the um, the goal and purpose of the Handling Life program is to help individual Christians who find themselves alone. Yes, and they don't know, you know, what do I do? Well, coming back to God is the is one of the easiest things, right? Just call out to Him and repent, ask for your forgiveness, confess your sins, and ask for forgiveness. But when you find yourself alone, and you, you're like, hey, I can't even talk to God about this. I can't talk to anybody about. It. I mean, that's Satan's got you. Yeah, he's playing. And ministries can find themselves in the same place. Like, I don't know what the next step is, or I don't know how to grow, or I don't know how to hire the new people we need because I don't know who they are. That's where you all can really, with your organization, you really step in and can help people and ministries understand. Uh, from the education side, what their next steps could be. Exactly, exactly. And thank you, Nathan, for manning this post. You know, people sometimes often say, well, I want to find out what my purpose is. I'm looking for my purpose. And sometimes, you know, just even that language, sometimes the words that we speak create, I mean, God's not standing out and he's not there to satisfy us by assigning us a purpose. As believers, God has a purpose and we get assignments <clears throat> as part of that purpose. So anything that we do, or manning our post to invite to advance his bigger plan. So yep. thank you for filling this niche. Thank you for, you know, the way that you are ministering and that you are making a difference. It will be immeasurable things that you will never see. The people that will come in contact with this, God will bring it to them just when they need it. So Plant, planting, planting, planting those seeds, right? That's what, that's what I'm, I'm about is, is just saying to people, Hey, you know, I, I've, I'm a Christian. I got saved when I was six. But I've made mistakes. I've made the wrong decisions. I've been to go through. I've had struggles. But the Lord really laid on my heart to admit my mistakes, to share them with others, to show them that, hey, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that things aren't going to go wrong, that you're not going to make the wrong choice. Peter denied Christ three times. That's right. It happens. It happens. But God is standing right there willing and ready to forgive and restore that's right See, and that's what i want to heal and to restore that doesn't mean we get out of the consequences that we've created we right. still have to go through the process of what we did but that's not god punishing us that's you know jonah was swallowed by the fish because he was somewhere where he shouldn't have been and he if he hadn't have been swallowed by the fish he would drown that's right so the fish wasn't punishment it was deliverance it took me a long time to figure that out in my life that sometimes when I think God's punishing me, it's actually me just going through what I put myself in, and God's actually made it a lot easier for me. Exactly. Exactly. The consequences. The consequences. The consequences of our actions. So I really appreciate you. I, I, I enjoy um, uh, our friendship over the years. We don't know each other extremely well, but I've, I've seen what you've done in your ministry and what you stand for, and it's it's encouraging to, to hear others share their story, to share what the difficulties they've been through and how God helped them. And that's what I encourage others. Get out there and just share. You don't have to go up to people and say, hey, are you going to hell? Hey, do you know God? Just go out and tell people what God has done for you. That's right. You avoided a wreck on the, on the highway on the way home? Mm -hmm. Share that on Facebook instead of griping about how long you had to work. Yes. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's it. It's through our stories and our relationships. Yeah. Show people, tell people what God has done for you and then let that get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do his job. That's right. And he will in his time and season. Yeah. We just keep sowing, planting, watering. Exactly. And repeat every day, right? Yes. Well, Tammy, thank you so much. And, um, I, again, I, I appreciate you so much being on the Handling Life podcast. And if you want to learn more about Handling Life, you can visit handlinglife.org.